I am the oldest of eight children. Before I was born, my father made a commitment to himself. He decided that he was going to be the perfect parent. Now, unfortunately for me, evidence of a perfect parent is a perfect child. I was not a perfect child. I had places I needed to be before I could walk, and I had things I needed to do before I could talk. By the time I was in third grade, I was so wiggly and unable to pay attention, the teacher recommended I be tested for special needs. The paperwork came back stamped in big, bold, black letters. It said, average. Now I imagine, if you're waiting to find out if your child has special needs, that finding out that she is average is probably a relief. But for me, that label forever meant that if I succeeded, it was because someone smarter, more talented, or more deserving didn't try. As a teenager, I won the beauty pageant in the small town where I went to high school. I was told it was because I ran against cows. I graduated valedictorian from that high school. And I was quickly reminded that there were only 89 kids in my class, and it's easy to look like an eagle when you're being compared to turkeys. I didn't have the opportunity to go to college right away, so I started looking for a job. I still remember the sound of the woman's voice when I accepted my first nine to five job for $13,500 a year. She said, really? And I thought, yeah, I need a job. It never occurred to me that her first offer wouldn't be a fair one, and it never occurred to me that I was worthy of negotiating for more. I called home to let them know that I'd gotten a job, and I got three pieces of advice. One, work hard. Two, be respectful. And three, don't ever quit. You might not be given another one. In my early 30s, I finally had the opportunity and the courage to apply to college. I was ecstatic when they let me in. Two and a half years later, I graduated with a GPA of 398. But at that point, it was so ingrained in me that I was average that I made the excuses. Well, I'm already a grown up. The other kids here are trying to figure out who they are. I've had a job where I was on call 24-7. I'm better at time management than they are. It's not that I'm smart, it's just that I'm willing to work harder. Again, I was ecstatic when they let me into grad school. But I spent the first several semesters expecting someone to tap me on the shoulder and say, I'm sorry, there's been a mistake. You don't belong here. Imposter syndrome. That's what the psychologists call it, the belief that we're frauds in our own lives. That if someone looked just a little too closely at our success, they'd realize it's just luck. We have no idea what we're doing. One thing I know that keeps imposter syndrome alive and well in our heads is negative people. You know the ones. They give you negative feedback, critical. You can't use it to get better, but you can certainly use it to feel badly about yourself. We all need to be brave enough to eliminate those negative people from our lives. My sister and I, we hold each other accountable to doing that by asking this question. Is there water in that well? Now let me explain what that means. We all know people who are deep emotional wells of love and support 
and kindness. They believe in us. And when we stumble, they pick us up. They dust us off. They set us back on our feet. And they say, try again. You can do this. I know you can. We also know people whose wells are empty. They parade in our lives as frenemies. And when we stumble, they laugh. And they say, why'd you even bother to try? When you learn there's no water in a well, stop going there looking for a drink. You are capable, you are sufficient, you are brave. The world needs your unique and valuable voice. Never stop sharing it. <laughs>